<laughs> Rita Cosby. Here she comes. Thank you. Thank you, man. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Hi, everybody. How are you? Welcome to Stage 17. Um, we are so excited about this guest today. Um, and to see so many great veterans here in the audience, this is really, really, really special for us. Of course, we're heading into Memorial Day, and we thought, what better way to honor those who could not be with us, because of course, Memorial Day is not just about going to the beach and picnics, it's about appreciating this country, and appreciating, I think, the greatest country in the world. And we are celebrating that today in, I think, the biggest, biggest way possible. We've had a lot of great rock stars and country stars here. I mean, we've had Trace Adkins, we've had Ed Sheeran, uh, we had Julian Lennon, I know a number of you there, you know, here uh, were there for that. But we have, I think, the biggest rock star of all time. <laughs> Truly, today, we do. Um, we have one of the most decorated Navy SEALs in US history. He was decorated 52 times. And this is the man who killed Osama bin Laden. And was not just on that mission, but was on hundreds of other really amazing, successful missions. And for me, this is very personal. Um, some of you may know my own father was a prisoner of war in World War II. He was a Polish resistance fighter. And he was captured by the Nazis. And at 90 pounds and six feet tall, my father escaped from a prisoner of war camp and literally came to a riverbed and was rescued by American troops. So for me, to honor America and to honor, I think, one of the greatest Americans ever, this is a real privilege. And to me, I think one of the greatest ways ever to spend as we lead into Memorial Day weekend. And also, we're also going to have a neat opportunity, because after this, we're going to have a great discussion and find out what that moment was like when he saw Osama bin Laden. But he also was involved with Captain Phillips, that very famous Somali case, of course, of the big movie with Tom Hanks. Also with the lone survivor, Marcus Luttrell case. So these are some of the most iconic cases and most heroic cases in modern military history. And this man was on the front lines of it all and has an amazing story to tell and an amazing way to honor so many of you who are here today. And we're so privileged to have all of you here. This makes it very, very special. And after I talk with him, we're going to open it up also uh, for some Q&A. We're going to put a microphone over here. So you're going to walk up. Please come up. And we're going to make it available to be able to ask him anything you'd ever like. Um, anything. The most embarrassing question ever. I think he can handle it. If he can kill Osama bin Laden, you can ask him anything. I don't think he's afraid of any question. And then after that, we're going to have a neat opportunity for all of you to take some pictures with him. Um, because for me, I get to interview a lot of people. And I got to, I've met so many celebrities and world leaders, but to me, this is one of those, this is one of the most special moments to be able to take a picture with a true hero, a true American hero. And without further ado, everybody, please give a huge round of applause to Mr. Rob O'Neill. Does a big crowd scare you? Not at all. All right. <laughs> uh, it was funny. I ran into a bunch of uh, the wounded warriors in the lobby, and it's like, oh, that's so weird that we're, oh, we're, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> well, this all makes sense. We're now, we're well, I mean, now you'll notice, too, a lot, a lot of places, doesn't matter what city you're in, if, if, if you go out, like, for a drink or for dinner, you're going to run into veterans. You always end up in the same spot. Is there some this, this kindred bond, of it's course? Something. It's something. It's the combination of uh, being thirsty and the lack of, of uh, direction, I think. <laughs> At least that's in my case. <laughs> and speaking of veterans, before we go further, I want to make sure uh, that we recognize some of the groups that are here. We have veterans from the Wounded Warrior Project and their family members. Everybody, please give a big round of applause to you guys. Awesome. And also, we have members of Combat Wounded Veterans of America. And before I bring some questions to you, would, would all of you who are veterans in the room, because we've got some great ones here, this is so special to have you here, um, and also family members, if you have, if you're a veteran, 
or you're a family member of a veteran, would you please stand so we can all give a big round of applause to you? Would all of you please stand who are veterans or family members of veterans who've served? Thank you. How awesome is that? That's awesome. Awesome. What does it feel like? You know, here, you're a guy, you're from Butte, Montana. Yes. By the way, I know where Butte, Montana is. You and I didn't even get a chance to talk about this. You've, you've been to Butte or you just know where it is? I have been to Butte, Montana. <laughs> um, and it's it's a beautiful place. Great people, great Green food. hunting. Oh, yeah. You weren't even planning at first on going into the military. How did no, this all start? I didn't, I didn't plan on the military at all. Uh, I decided pretty much in a day that I was going to join the military because I got dumped. <laughs> A girl. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry we do this to you guys. That's all right. <laughs> well, no, when I got to boot camp, though, it turns out like 95% of the guys were there for the same reason. <laughs> all, all volunteer military, they call it. That's not necessarily true. You run away from the women. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, uh, I, was, I was trying to join them. I, I wanted to leave town. I'm, I always tell people that things are so bad that you can't handle them. Just go on an adventure. You know? And so uh, the adventure was to join the Marine Corps. So I went to join the Marine Corps. And I learned very early on that sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, because as luck would have it, the Marine recruiter was out to lunch, and the Navy guy was there. And it's a small office in, in Montana, yeah. so right? He, the Marine was there, the <laughs> Navy guy is here. And the only reason I went up to the Navy guy, this is the truth, is um, I had two friends at War Marines that I, that I grew up with that were two years older. Every time they came home, they went to boot camp together. Every time they came home, they looked like Marines, uh, confident, fit great uniforms, and they told me something, you know, tongue-in-cheek. They said, you know the Marine Corps is actually part of the Department of the Navy, <laughs> just the men's department. Oh! <laughs> oh the only reason I went over to him was because uh, I said, where's the Marine? If you're in the same department, so you're going to know. And he's like, why do you want the Marine? He's, I said, I want to be a sniper. I said, oh, you're good. We have snipers in the Navy. All you need to do is become a SEAL. Kind of brushed over that. And uh, <laughs> you can say, that's how it happened. I didn't, I didn't know how to swim. You didn't. No, nope. and I'm standing in it. I'm standing in in front of him, and I'm like, you know, I'm I'm 19 and I'm kind of naive, but this guy's a professional recruiter. Why is he going to lie to me? Mm, and so he, <laughs> yeah, he talked me into it. I know you, but I I saw you didn't know what to do push ups or pull ups or what was. It? No, I couldn't swim. So no, but you also were having trouble with what? Uh, the pull ups were difficult. Yeah, right. Because I did, I wasn't big. In, I I played college basketball, but not. I mean, it's not as physical as you think. You run, you jump. You learn how to shoot free throws. That's about it. Uh, Pull-ups were harder than I thought, uh, but I, you know, I had five months. He gave me the, the to sign now, five months you leave, so I had to learn all that stuff in five months, and I found out what SEALs were. I read a few of the books. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. I'll stay positive. I'm still going to go, and I was smart enough to get it in my contract that I get a tryout. You know, then I, I make it or I don't. Then I get four years of an adventure, and I come home, and, and that's it. That's how that's how it started. Now you had a brief encounter with the seal because you're a hunter, yeah, and, that five and your months, dad's yes, a hunter, right? Yes. And you gave him a chore, yes, sort of a hunting tour up to the top. I I had a spot where I used to go. He he came up like a typical military guy. He never been to Montana. Hundred pound ruck will just put me off on the side of the road. I'll walk up for a few days and come out with an animal. He didn't. And then I was like, well, this guy's a, you know, he's a vet. I'll just, I'll take him up to my spot. Normally I was, I would hike up a mountain four or five breaks just to be smart about it. But I'm like, well, this guy's a Navy SEAL. I, I just go the full thing at once. So we went up uh, the whole mountain in one spot. D didn't stop. It was hard on both of us, but we did make it there. We did see elk, uh, nothing legal to shoot, but we got into him. And, and uh, he just told me, he's like, you know, walking up a mountain like that, that this is probably a good call for you. We do some of that. So you get into it. Now, mm -hmm. tell us about the training, because it is intense. I know a lot of the Navy SEALs, you and I have some yes. mutual friends. Yes, we do. Um, the ex it's intense. It is. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a start to finish on day one, technically, is it's eight months long with, um, you know, it's calisthenics all the time, 1,000 push-ups a day, 1,000 set-ups a day, 1,000 flutter kicks. Did you have to swim? Um, you swim a lot, yeah. All right. We, uh, <laughs> we're, we're doing the, the test is, is a two-mile ocean swim that you need to pass every week. But then there's hours and hours in the pool with fins, without fins, tied up, uh, doing different drills, can, teaching you how to not panic. Like, panicking is not going to help, so just enjoy being tied up and exhale so you sink and all that weird stuff. I knew stuff. some people who enjoyed being tied up, no. but that's a whole different thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's for another time. <laughs> But I mean, even even where they would, the grinder where we work out and the, the beaches and the obstacle course, it was a mile to the galley. So just, you're running six miles a day just to eat on top of the additional 14 miles a day that you're running. And it's, it's a very, very difficult course. And the washout rate right now is 85%. Wow. It was 80 when I went through. It's 85 now. They've gotten smarter about it. 
uh, you know, log PTs, all kinds of bizarre workouts. And that's just until Hell Week. And then Hell Week is when they wake you that's up. That's not Hell Week. No, no, no. All right. That, that's, that's, that's the, no, that's the, that's the days. Hell Week starts on a Sunday. When I went through it, it was week five. Uh, they wake you up on Sunday afternoon and they keep you awake until Friday. So you're, you're doing all that stuff, always wet and... That sounds like my job at WABC. Yeah, right? <laughs> Just ask my boss over there. <laughs> so yeah, and then you get through the physical stuff. The first, I mean, it is technically nine. It's more like 15 weeks. And then you get into the diving. So it's, you still do physical stuff every day, but then you start learning about dive medicine, dive physics, different laws, how pressures and um, volume relate and, and um, uh, partial pressures of oxygen and dive tables and um, phys- physiology, how to do stuff. And then, then you get into de- demolition and shooting and all kinds of stuff. It's- what about waterboarding, torture, being held captive, tr- that preparation, God forbid the worst happens? Uh, not, I mean, that gets into a different kind of school, but like the, the torture, th- the, the, wa- the waterboarding, I'm not worried about because they're not going to waterboard us if they catch us. They're just going to cut our heads off. Can't oh, really, that's all. That's you all. You can't right? really prep for that, and that's like a one-time thing. Um, but no, they 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 do they they they, they, they just they, they do mess you with mess with you with the water. But that's just to teach you that uh, you can get through most stuff. You can convince your body through your mind to do anything. And if they drown, if you drown, when you do, they just they resuscitate you. You learn how to do that a lot. And I've seen you know, I've you've seen people go die and wake right up, and just it's a uh, it's quite a place. That's just the training, yeah. though. Could you tell who was going to make it? Now, no, that's the training. No. Through the, the, the 85% who weren't going to, could you say, okay, I no, can absolutely. tell that guy's not going to make it? No, it's, it's hard to tell because, I mean, most of the loudmouths wash out first. They quit first. Some loudmouths make it. Most of the quiet guys make it. Some don't. Um, it's, it's hard to tell. Like, I, I couldn't swim. I made it, and I know um, collegiate water polo players that didn't make it. So it's hard, it's hard to tell. It's, the, the common theme is positive attitude. And if you get negative, it's gonna it's gonna build on you. Why, why are you looking back? We're going that way, right? Um, and just not quitting. The uh, some of the best advice that I got was don't quit now. When you feel like quitting, and you will, do not quit now. Just quit tomorrow. So much mental. Yeah, it's just too. all mental. So and much it's just mental. little little victories. Just uh, get don't think about eight months from now. Think just try to get through this and make it to breakfast. So through all of this, then you get into it. You did. 400 missions. And what's amazing, uh, Rob O'Neill, is that you also had successful missions where nobody was killed. I mean, that's an incredible perspective. Well, no, every mission I was on, no one was hurt. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Think about that, you guys. 400 missions, no one hurt. That is huge. Unbelievable. We were fortunate for a number of reasons, though, because we were able to fight on our terms. We could pick a target, decide whether or not we're going, and then hit at night and uh, quietly get out. And I'd be the first to say that there are, and, and even in the audience, I mean, there are men and women that had much more dangerous jobs than we did. Driving around Yeah, you Irish. should see my job at WABC. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> IEDs everywhere. <laughs> exactly. But uh, no, I mean, we, we were able to, you know, a lot more people who don't don't get the platform that I do, that, you know, don't quite get the... Um, it's a lot more dangerous to walk through the, the fields in Afghanistan when it's 120 degrees out in July than it is to fly in a helicopter, pick a lock, sneak in, sneak out. So, How much did your Butte, Montana, beautiful Butte, Montana, mm-hmm. that I know and love, how much did the hunting and that background and, and living sort of you know off the land, your dad taught you very well, you, you mm-hmm. were a hunter, you, you knew how to survive, did that prepare you for these moments? I think the only thing from Montana that prepared me was the knowing the altitudes and knowing how it's going to affect Knowing uh, that when you're planning on going to, you know, a target on top of a mountain that, that you want to be careful of how much weight you carry and ounces will turn into pounds. Do I need this pistol when I should be carrying a cleaning rod? I actually came up with, because with, uh, a lot of people carry a secondary weapon because if your primary goes down, you go to your secondary. I learned in combat that if my primary went down, by the time I got to my pistol, my buddy already shot him. Right. So I don't need this. So just take the There's one. There's a few pounds gone. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What about and the I, rocket launcher? What about that? <laughs> I had rangers for that. <laughs> so tell us about, of course, the, the most amazing mission of your life, the preparation that goes into knowing we're going to go after Osama bin Laden. Mm-hmm. When did you know and what kind of preparation went into that moment? We knew about three weeks before we left. They, to- they The time they told us that we were going somewhere to the time they told us who it was was like two days, maybe a day and a half, but we figured it out before that. Yeah, how just, much earlier did you figure it out? Well, we just we we were asking questions. The way it started, the question, the way it started was the reason you're here is because we found a thing. This thing is in a house in a bowl between these mountains. This mount, this bowl's in a country. You're going to go in and get it and bring it back. 
And we're like, well, where is it? Can't tell you. Okay, fine. How are we getting there? Can't tell you. It's, and eventually they would answer, well, it's like a helicopter. But what, well, what do you mean like a helicopter? <laughs> so we're thinking different platforms got to be here. Maybe it's Libya. And just based on everything you're thinking, okay, it's high value, obviously, because this person's here. Then you just, okay, this is Bin Laden. Um, it's in the book. It's a better story, and it's actually the way a veteran would talk. And the story is actually funny. I just can't say it today, but it's, it's, it's a good story. <laughs> it is. It is a good it, story. It, invo- it involves... Uh, C- colorful language. Yes, it does involve, which is which is good. In the book, you can do it. Mm-hmm. We can bleep it a little on air, eh. but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not. So when you find out, okay, it's been Laden, mm-hmm. what goes through your mind? Here you've had all these other amazing missions, but that moment, what just as an American and as a are we going? Are trained, we going right now? It's like you found him, we're ready now. Well, no, you need to train. No, we don't. Show me where he is. I, barely, I barely need a gun. Just give me a... Was was that rush there? Was no, that like- no 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 no? Um, we'd done it so many times. They they picked um, they picked a group of prof- professionals, and uh, they they explained to us you, you you might not go, but you're one of the five options that we have. So we're going to take you to a site where you're going to train on it, not for yourselves. And they said we respect the fact that you know your tactics, you developed them, but we need to show the people who might make the decision that you can do it. This is kind of how the chain of command works, especially when you're dealing with politicians. So uh, so we did. So we trained for a while, and and it was interesting. We came up with different. We had the model. We're going to do this. We came up with the perfect plan. And I think as most people here know, the only time the perfect plan exists is when you're planning. As soon as you leave to execute the mission, everything changes. So uh, we just we planned on it. We rehearsed it with helicopters, without, and we talked about it. And, and there was even a night when we, we, we come up with every contingency, and the boss said, all right, what's the worst thing that could happen? And the youngest guy in the room said, well, maybe the helicopter will crash in the front yard. Which happened, yes, right? <laughs> that's exactly what happened. So we talked about that for 30 seconds, and that happened. Wow. But no, we were ready for it, and we, uh, we went overseas. You know, we, we did the final preparation with the families, and they didn't know where we were going, but I had the last meal with the kids, and they didn't know it was the last meal, and we accepted the fact that we weren't going to come home. You believed that you yeah. would probably not make it back. Yeah, 90% chance. What did you think would happen to you? You get shot down you? on the way in. We're uh, invading a sovereign nation with whom we're not at war. And not telling Pakistan. Not, no. And um, You know what was amazing to me always when, when that happened? And I was one of, one of the few journalists who knew about bin Laden. I actually requested an interview with him mm. in uh, 2000. So did I. Yeah, yeah. I got my... <laughs> you got to talk to him. I didn't. That's the difference. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but I remember when it happened, and you, first of all, you're going into Pakistan. Mm-hmm. I can't even imagine. They don't know you're going in. No. And then there's the military academy. Their equivalent of the West Point is right down yeah, the street. Yeah, less than a mile away. Were you shocked how it was literally right there? No. Um, they knew he was there. The, yeah, it's a big house, maybe not, huge Maybe house. not the military, but the, the intelligence services inside of Pakistan have every reason to know he's there and every reason to protect him based on their interests. Uh, I'm not saying the entire Pakistani military knew he was there, or even some of the government, but the, the intel, uh, 100%, I would, I would bet on that. I know it for a fact, actually. And when you look at the fact it's this huge house in the middle mm-hmm. of this tiny little village, it stands out. Um, obviously, the big walls around it. Yes. Um, we know the story of the doctor who mm-hmm. was coming in and out and getting the swabs and all the... And we saw in Zero Dark Thirty, the famous movie of the operator who also provided or put all the intel together, too. Yes. She was real. That's yeah, absolutely right. Yes, um, but you still don't know a hundred percent until I you're was there. convinced by how convincing she was. Yes, you were by her. Did mm-hmm. you talk to her? Oh yeah, she was with us the whole the whole, the whole time, up, up until we. Le- she went to, even to Afghanistan with us. I ran into her after, um, right before we left, and she was pacing, and I was like, what, "What's why are you nervous?" And she goes, "Are you kidding me? Why aren't you nervous?" And I'm like, "Because well, we do this every night. We fly somewhere, we mess with people, we fly home. But you need to be right, so I understand why you're nervous now." How was um, the movie Zero Duck Thirty, which we all saw, a lot of us saw with Jessica Chastain? Yes. Was that pretty close? It was good. To? It was good. I've I've seen it a bunch of times. Pretty realistic. As far as the the agency goes, yes, I think it was good. They really put their A team on there. I was very impressed with every analyst. It wasn't just one woman. It was a group a group of women, and then a few guys, and they were really good. Um, I could pick apart tactics in any movie, which I would on that one. It was fine. I mean, the stuff that actually happened. I wish I could have helped if they wanted to make a great movie because. It's a lot easier than, they, than they, Hollywood makes it look, and it's a lot cooler. And there's, there's a little more dark humor, and especially at the end when she fi- finally saw the body. That's in the book, too. I'm not going to ruin it. Plus, I can't use that language either. Oh, shoot. That's a good <laughs> tease, everybody. And again, everybody, the book is called The Operator. I've been selling for three weeks. I got this. I know you got You're a pro. You're a pro. I think you're pretty good at whatever you do. 
Um, you're, so you get the word, okay, you're, you're on the chopper, the chopper goes down, mm -hmm. you're walking through the house, and you've got the guy in front of you, of course. Well, I didn't know the helicopter crashed. Oh, you hadn't known yet, okay. I was in the other one. Okay, so, no, I knew that, but, yeah. but you did, they didn't tell you the No, other they tried one. to, but we didn't understand. Okay. They said dash one going down, and we thought they said dash one going around. So we thought they took fire, came back into. It's very dangerous to fast rope on top of people. So, right. okay, and then we we went and did a few things, and we blew a door that turned out to be a fake door, and it was a wall that didn't collapse. We're sort of figuring, okay, this is good because it's fake. We'll blow. So we told them we'll blow this door, and they said, don't we're, don't blow it. We'll open it. They opened it, and the thumb came out. And that's a point in like when stuff is going on, and you need to worry about stuff that or think about stuff that matters. I was thinking, I don't know how our guys got in there, but I'm not worried about it because they're in there. Right. We'll talk about it tomorrow. They're in there. So you just go in. Their helicopter crashed, but I'm looking this way. It's like, hey, there's this house. We know what we're going to do. We actually got in to the house, and that's when one of the guys told me. So I'm in, I'm in the back looking down a hallway, and one of the guys whispered, helicopter crash. I'm like, oh, man, which one? I thought it was some of, the, some of our guys behind us, way behind us. And he goes, bro, our helicopter crashed. You walked right past us. I'm like, Okay. And as we're saying this, the sniper who was running around the perimeter with the dog, as we're having this conversation, he ran into the famous part of the tail that was on the fence. He came over the radio. He was on my helicopter. And he said, all right, everybody be aware. They're ready for us. They have a training mock-up of our super secret helicopter in the front yard. And then the boss goes, no, Jack, that's ours. We crashed. <laughs> He goes, yeah, you're right. That makes more sense than the shit I was just saying. I'm sorry. <laughs> so now you're having this discussion. Now, yeah, as we're in Bin Laden's house. And you're in the house and you're having this. Yeah, and that's when we realize, okay, now this, <laughs> this too can be discussed tomorrow. So then we can... <laughs> Let's continue the <laughs> yeah. mission. Yeah, seriously. That's the kind of stuff, stuff that was going on. So you had this thing. You figure out, okay, it's your helicopter, uh -huh. the whole thing. You're going in. There's a guy in front of you. Well, first of all, there's no, a scene, there was, by the way, there was, there was eight guys, seven guys in front yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and I'm this is going about the down one the hall. who. So, well, yeah, but we, we didn't get up there yet. So, I'm behind these guys. What was unique about my spot is that now I'm in a spot in the back, what we call the train, and I can watch guys work. So, I'm, I'm watching the greatest mission in the history of the SEAL teams, but it's my guys, and I have front row seats. So, I remember thinking the entire time, they're so cool. I'm so proud of these guys. This house should come down on us. A houseborn ex improvised explosive device at any time, and these guys don't care. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Kick, mechanical, explosive, and they're calm. Yeah, focus, and not even talking. Other so than they, figuring out the helicopter. Well, that thing was, <laughs> that was a quick one. Uh, between that and like switching out Copenhagen with each other, and then um, <laughs> then uh, we get to the thing and the door that was barricaded, and we start going up, and that's again when I'm looking up six, seven guys in front of me. And the analyst that found Bin Laden said that you're going to run into Khalid, Bin Laden, somewhere on the stairs. I don't know where the stairs are. They're in there. And so we're up there, and I'm watching. It's quiet. And they saw Khalid. He jumped behind a banister. And the, the guy in front just kind of quietly said, Khalid, Khalid, like Urfa Hidek. He's talking to him. And Khalid just went, what? That was it. Very smart. Khalid was armed well within his rules of engagement. Um, he just talked him into it because they were in a weird spot. And that happened. Then we went up another level. The guys in front of me, other than the point man, started clearing their spots. Then that's just the way the tactics have worked every time. Then it's down to two of us. So it's the point man and myself right. looking up the stairs through a curtain. They're clearing off to our right and left. And the point man started talking to me. Didn't know it was me. Knew it was his two man, one of his guys. And he just convinced me we got to get up there now because he could see people moving and we need, they're putting on suicide vests. We got to go. And he just convinced me to do it. And I wanted more, but we didn't have them. And it wasn't bravery at this point, but I know Bin Laden's right there. It wasn't bravery. I just remember thinking, I'm tired of worrying about it. We're going to blow up. Let's get it over with. And I squeezed him on the shoulder. We went up. He moved the curtain, and he jumped on the people he assumed were uh, de defense, like a suicide bombers. He jumped on them to absorb the blast, which is the bravest thing I've ever seen. And I'm thinking about how brave that was. I turned to the right, and there's Bin Laden three feet in front of me. Standing with his hands on his wife's shoulder, I saw him. He's taller than I thought, skinnier than I thought, shorter beard, gray hair. That's his nose. He's a threat. That's Bin Laden. He's a bomber. You got to take him down. And the way you treat a suicide bomber is you shoot him in the face. Um, I've been with suicide bombers before. It's very fast. It's loud. It's permanent. And people who question why'd you shoot him in the face, that's why. Because a suicide bomber, people live a lot longer in real life than they do in the movies. And a suicide bomber connects two circuits. The thing goes off. You need to make sure they're not mobile. And that's what happened. Multiple shots. Yes, three. What goes through your mind, Rob O'Neill, at that moment? You're looking at well, the most wanted man in the world. What went through the, at that point was the room's not clear yet. And the wife was still there. I had to move her to the bed. The son is there. He's about three years old. 
Uh, I do remember thinking, as a father, this poor kid's got nothing to do with this. He's just here. And I picked him up, put him by his, his mom, and that's when it hit me. And other SEALs are clearing the room, and I, I stood there. And my, my buddy, who had been engaged downstairs and killed one of the terrorists, he came up to me and he goes, uh, you okay? And I said, yeah, what do we do now? And he just this big smile, and he goes, well, now we go find the computers. Um, you've done this with me hundreds of times. <laughs> and I said, oh, you're right. I'm back. And he goes, yeah, you just killed Osama bin Laden, so your life just changed. I'm like, okay, let's find the computers, I guess. And, that's, and then we just started to roll through what we normally do, and, and we realized um, we want to be on the ground. We've been here for this many minutes. We want to be out in 34. Let's find everything we can, and let's leave. And that's, that's when it starts to th- sink in. Like, we might, we might pull this off. We might live. This house hasn't blown up yet. We can go. So we started finding computers, finding. We found uh, uh, all kind, like pounds, hundreds of pounds of opium, pornography, guns, um, you know, but we found what we wanted, and then we got out, and we got in the helicopters, and then we started flying out, and it w- was, what was interesting is one of the helicopters that came in, the one that I got on was one that other SEALs from my same command, but different squadron was on, this. so they kind of rescued us, so we all jumped in there, we're flying away, and the guy on, below me was the sniper from the Captain Phillips raid, so I'm laying on top of him, the guy next to me is a SEAL from Montana. I'm sorry, Manhattan, from right here. And he asked There's me... There's a little difference between Montana yes, and Manhattan, there is, by the there way. there is. I, I got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> Quite a bit. So um, he's from Manhattan, and he said... Um, he asked me what every veteran asked as soon as they found out. They said, who got him? And I said, I did. And he said, on behalf of my family, thank you. Which was... They kind of sunk in a little bit. And then the sniper from the Captain Phillips raid, who had up to this point done the most historic thing in the teams he pulled his his copenhagen out and said here take one of mine now you know what it's like it's like okay fair enough and then we're flying out and we got 90 minutes 90 minutes to go that way and we can live wow. we're gonna live and how long were you in in airspace how long were you in pakistani airspace uh, 90 minutes in was it 90 in pakistan itself mm-hmm. it was i didn't yeah. realize it was that long that was in the pakistan, window yes which is a long window especially when they're going to shoot at you and you're in a helicopter. That's a heck of a long window. So what's going on in your mind? And then, and Well, then I don't want to minutes. jinx it is what's going on. It's like, yeah. no, it's been 20 minutes. Okay, so 70 more. Then it's like an hour. We get an hour and we get 50 more years of life. Now it's been, you know, and we've got this long. And then, and then I, it's almost like watching a, a no-hitter in the top of the sixth. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to jinx this, but it might happen. And then we get to 50 minutes, 60 minutes, 70 minutes. And then it turns into the hockey game in Lake Placid when the Americans are beating the Russians. You can hear them counting down. <laughs> you don't, I don't game. want to start the 10, <laughs> 9, being all nervous. And then we're 85 minutes into the flight, and the pilot came over the radio. And just very calmly, like a pilot does, the pilots are so cool. He goes, all right, gentlemen, for the first time in your lives, you're going to be happy to hear this. Welcome to Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, got it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that's when the... That's when the uh, that's when the high five started. Yeah, what went through your mind when you suddenly you're like, I am I am free. I'm alive, and I just killed. No, I didn't. I Osama didn't, bin Laden. I didn't, I didn't think I just killed Bin Laden. I just I thought that we are going to be the best friends for the rest of our lives. This we pulled this off. I can't wait to talk to that pilot that put that helicopter down to save everyone's life. If he would have tried to power up, he would have flipped it, killed everyone. But he made the decision like that. I've got to, I got to put it there. I got to put the tail on that fence. Like that's just I just to look around and see this team. It was just it was just cool. It was just very very cool. Very honored to be asked to do that. Because you got to figure when we when we went in and I, I love having a having a happy conversation. When we were going in, um, I had the guy that actually led me up the stairs. He pulled me aside and said, "Hey, uh, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying I'm not going. I'm going. But if we know we're going to die, why are we going?" And I said, well, we're not going for ourselves. We're not going for fame. We're going for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday morning. And 45 minutes later, she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper because that was the better alternative than burning alive at 2,500 degrees. She wasn't supposed to do that. She doesn't fight. We fight. And that's why we're going. And that's, we went for, we went for New York, you know, and that was what we talked about. And, and that's, and, and. And that's what made it easy. That's, that's what made it easy was, was um, this is our job. We came for the, the, the passengers on, on flight 93 were braver than we were. You know, and that, that's, we had these conversations. I mean, it was a, it was a serious deal, but we're, you know, I mean, it's giving me goosebumps right now. And, just, and what an honor to be picked to be a part of that team. There's, there are so many, so many uh, people out there in the, in the military who could have done it, but they asked us and, and we did it. 